All right, welcome everybody. My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Thrilled to have you joining us again for the virtual reading group, which is uh, right now uh, beginning a book we haven't read before, The Jewish Writings, uh, by edited by uh, Jerome Cohn and, and Ron Feldman. Um, as we've this is only our second session on this book. So as we talked about last week, um, this is a, this book spans three decades of writings, four, yeah, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, four decades of writings. Sorry, math is always uh, complicated for one. Um, and uh, it really, there's a way in which, um, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna get a kind of very particular Biographic, biographical uh, introduction to Hannah Arendt reading these books, especially in these essays in the 30s and the 40s, um, where you'll you'll see a Hannah Arendt that many of you probably don't know very well, right? From well, if you know her works like, you know, The Human Condition or On Revolution or or others, um, this is the Hannah Arendt who uh, is a refugee, uh, is a political actor. Uh, is struggling um, to make sense of rising totalitarianism uh, in Germany. And now, as you'll see in a couple of the essays that we read for today, as a stateless refugee in, in France um, and figuring out how uh, to respond to it. Um, so you're, you get a wide range here. You get her um, early thinkings about assimilation and anti-Semitism. Uh, which are themes um, she wrote about her entire life. Uh, and then you get, uh, you know, her joy at uh, experiencing um, uh, the Youth Aliyah, uh, a group that is going to help bring young Jewish uh, refugees to Israel and Palestine, uh, which she will then help uh, to do. Um, and so it, it really is a, a, a wide mix. Um, I thought uh, I, I'd begin with this this essay that we the first one we read for today, and and it's the one I'll, I'll spend most of the time on for in the introduction. Um, original assimilation, right? Now, last week uh, we read uh, another essay called "The Enlightenment and the Jewish Question." Um, in which uh, she argues that the modern Jewish question was framed by the Enlightenment. Um, and if you'll recall, she says it all goes back to Lessing uh, and this question of, uh, on the one hand, the distinction of, of reason and history, um, and thus sort of the loss of, of truth as a dogma. Um, and the second is um, that uh, and, and the second is this idea um, that humans share, uh, that what humans share as a kind of what holds us together as humans. What, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but this is what will reappear in um, a number of places in the origins of totalitarianism as the idea of humanity, right? Um, uh, something that she she argues was absolutely essential and that she thinks was lost um uh ar around the time of of the holocaust the idea of humanity that there's something that we humans share um uh based on a kind of r rationality or reasonableness that leads to tolerance um and and so uh, in that first essay that we that we read that was from 1932 she she talks about um, the way in which the Enlightenment and then the counter Enlightenment in the in the Romantics um, frame uh, the Jewish question, and so uh, the Jews are now no longer seen, first of all, as sort of just simply Jews. Then in the Enlightenment, they're seen as um, uh, you know as as people who can assimilate into the Enlightenment into educated people. And then in the Romantic era, they're returned back to Jews um, as a chosen people, as from people from Palestine, as Asiatics or foreigners. But now in the return 
in the Romantic era, they, they don't return to being a, a situated, founded people who are um, who return to a kind of um, settled, situated, religious, ethical life as Jews. Um, they actually are now returned to their Jewishness without actually being Jewish. They've become enlightened and now they're seen again as Jews, but they're not, they don't actually have the religious aspect. They have something general like religiosity. Um, and, and so they have lost their historical ties and yet they're still seen as Jews. And that return um, is uh, what you'll call modern anti-Semitism uh, in many ways, uh, both in that essay and in this new essay uh, on original, this new essay, which is also from 1932, on original assimilation. So they're written the same year. You can you can see that they cover a lot of the same problems. Um, both Mendelssohn and Herder are 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 main characters in both of them, um, and uh, and you'll obviously see some of the um, concerns that she's grappling with. Okay, so this new essay, Original Assimilation, an epilogue to the 100th anniversary of Rahel von Hagen's death. Um, just some of you have read uh, RN's book on Rahel von Hagen uh, in this virtual reading group with us. Um, if you if you haven't and you and you want to learn a little bit about it, there are a whole series of these lectures on the book that you could go back and listen to. You could also read the book, which is even better. Um, but this was a book that um, RN got involved in uh, this project on on Ravel, Rahel von Hagen a few years before this, um, and it was going to be her Habilitation, which in German in Germany is um, uh, what one writes as a as a as doing a in, in lieu of what we call a PhD dissertation, and um, it's your first big book, um, and um, she had, was working on Rahel von Hagen, who was a a Jewish, uh, born a Jewish um, woman in Berlin, and um, as RN tells it, had nothing to recommend her, right? She wasn't beautiful, she wasn't intelligent, she wasn't, I mean, she wasn't intelligent, she wasn't cultured, she wasn't educated, it's a difference. Um, and, and she really had nothing, she was excluded from the public world. And she was able to enter the public world, um, and become a person, a meaningful person who became famous um, in a number of ways, uh, primarily through um, her holding of salons, which were in vogue at the time, and uh, becoming one of the leading solanaires, these people who hold these salons and people come and, and hang out with them. And, um, and, and, and in doing that, she became a public person. And then when the Jews were then once again excluded from the salons and you were not allowed to or no one would come to a Jewish salon, she lost her public person. And then she had to find another way to be a public person. Um, and that's when she married um, Count uh, Von Hagen, um, who gave her another way of being a human being um, or a, 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 a public person. Um, and then edited her lifelong correspondence which has made her famous and rn's book on von hagen is, is i think still the, the sort of main book a new a new edition of that book two new editions of that book actually came out this year um one uh which is a hugely scholarly endeavor uh, uh the book itself is over a thousand pages and includes um many versions of the book in both english and german um uh, was published as part of the um, uh, Gesamtausgabe of the collected works of Hannah Arendt. And the other is a new short little volume um, published uh, in the New York Review of Books series, um, uh, you know, sort of in a sort of the simplest way. So if one is the height of popular publishing, the other is the height of scholarly publishing, um, there seems to be a lot of interest in, in Rahel von Hagen. Um, and I think for good reasons, it's a great book. And um, and so we'll talk a little bit about her in a second. In any case, um, uh, in this essay on original assimilation, there's a few 
in a sense, almost thesis-like points that Arendt makes at the beginning. And um, we need to understand those, those thesis-like points. The first one is that she says, assimilation must um, declare its bankruptcy, right? It's the first sentence. Today in Germany, it seems Jewish assimilation must declare its bankruptcy. Um, I think that's fairly clear, but it's also, I think we have to be aware of how strong that claim is. Um, assimilation is bankrupt. This is one of the, um, this is one of the ideas that runs through Arendt's writing, both on Jews, but also on race in general um, throughout her life. Um, and I think, and I will tell you that I think it's one of the more um, profound and also difficult to understand aspects of her writing. I mean, I think many people who read Arendt as casual readers or even as scholars of Arendt think of her as an assimilated Jew, right? Um, and I don't think that's totally wrong. Uh, she she wasn't religious. She she lived in the in the in the public world, both in Germany, then in France, then in the United States. Um, and 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 there's a way in which one can argue she's an assimilated Jew. And yet, and this is important, RN always, in almost every time she writes about it, argues against assimilation argues that assimilation is a fool's bargain, that it doesn't work, that here she calls it bankrupt. And, um, and so part of what we have to grapple with in thinking about Arendt and these questions of Judaism and assimilation and racism is, is her belief in an important way that uh, assimilation is, a, is, is not something that works. Um, and, 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 and take that seriously. Okay. Um, if assimilation is bankrupt, um, at the same time, she says that, uh, assimilation means, um, the entry of Jews into the historical human world. Okay. That's, that's a definition. Assimilation, Jewish assimilation is a fact that the Jews entered the historical human world. Um, that means that instead of living in a shtetl, and then even instead of living in a ghetto in Frankfurt or Berlin or wherever, or Paris, they sought to leave the Jewish world and enter into an historical European world. They sought to be part of a world that was not a Jewish world, but a European world. and. To do that, to enter the historical European world, um, they had to, she says, assimilate to the Enlightenments, to the Enlightenment. So this goes back to the first essay that we read last week um, on the Jewish question. You can only become a Jew assimilated into the world by becoming uh, an enlightened person. Um, that means you claim to be emancipated from your particularity as a Jew to be a, a general uh, European. And in that emancipation, you claim equal rights and, and human rights. Um, and thus, uh, as an assimilated Jew, you claim to be uh, like everybody else and not therefore a Jew. Um, this fact of assimilation into the Enlightenment, um, she says, on the one hand, is a fact. It's what happened. On the other hand, it later became an ideology, an ideology that can no longer be maintained. And so then she'll say, in a number of places in this essay, um, the reality of assimilation has been refuted. So on the one hand, it was a fact. This is what happened. On the other hand, it's an ideology that can no longer be maintained and it's been refuted. Um, and so while it was a fact, it's no longer a fact or it's a fact that has been, um, uh, that has failed to solidify itself in the world. Um, and, and so uh, assimilation has failed. Um, 
She also says that anti-Semitism, particularly this modern form of anti-Semitism, or um, is directed against assimilated Jews as bearers of the Enlightenment. Um, and here she brings up again Moses of Mendelssohn, who still wanted to emancipate the Jews as Jews, right? If you remember this essay we read last week, he still wanted the Jews to be emancipated and have equal rights, but still wanted them to be Jewish. Once the Enlightenment fully takes hold, and in the second generation of Enlightenment thinkers, that's no longer possible. Because for to be emancipated, the Jews have to assimilate not into the Enlightenment, not as Jews, but as enlightened citizens. Um, they can only become enlightened subjects. And this means that the question of Jewish assimilation is no longer a question of the Jews as a group. It's now a question of Jews as each individual. Each individual Jew either succeeds or fails in their attempt to assimilate to the history of European society in the, as an enlightened subject. Um, and modern anti-Semitism, which can have both a social and a formal or legal component, she says, um, uh, says to the assimilated Jew who claims to be a European citizen, a European enlightened citizen, you are a problem. You don't fit. You're not European but nor are you Jewish and you're sort of in this mixed area. And sometimes we let you in because we find you fascinating and interesting. And we like the kind of thrill we get by associating with someone like you, right? And sometimes we then kick you out and uh, push you back because you're always still a Jew. Even when we like you, even when we're friends with you, even when we, to invite you to dinner and go to your salons, you're always still a Jew and we're never gonna really um, uh, accept you as one of us. Um, that's, the, uh, that's, that's, that's sort of what she is talking about here in these first two pages um, of this essay on original assimilation. She then uh, gives four examples of what she calls individual individuals who sought to succeed and largely did succeed in assimilating. Um, one is, is Henrietta Hertz, um, born Henrietta Le de Lemos, um, who was like Rahel Van Hagen, famous for the salons that she started uh, in Prussia. Uh, she was unlike um, uh, um, Rahel Van Hagen, she was exceptional and you know what the quote unquote exceptional Jew. Um, she was exceptional in the fact that she was a scholar. She spoke Latin and Greek and she was a great intellectual. And as Arendt says, she bribed the world, the European world through virtue by showing how brilliant she was. And they accepted the bribe and she was allowed to uh, largely assimilate. Um, so you might say, well, isn't that an example of success? Um, you'll see when we talk about Rahel Van Hagen why Arendt thinks it doesn't, but just the, the, there's a cost to Henrietta Hertz's success in assimilating, which is, as Arendt says, um, she developed a reputation for coldness because she remained untouched. Nothing got through to her. She had to deny who she was. She had to deny that she was a Jew. And she always was a Jew. Now, we, we don't, Arendt doesn't do a lot on Henrietta Hertz. She hasn't done a lot of research, so we don't go into it. But when we get to Rahel Van Hagen, whom Arendt spent years living with in her letters and, and diaries, you'll see that even though Rahel Van Hagen succeeded in assimilating on one level, she was always uneasy with it and always nervous. Has she left traces behind of her Judaism? Is she still a Jew? Are people going to know that she's a Jew? And so that's part of the failure that she's going to talk about. Dorothea Schlegel, um, who uh, was Mendelssohn's daughter and married Friedrich Schlegel, the great writer, um, 
you know, RN has very little to say about her except to say she assimilated in a different way, um, which is by becoming the wife of Schlegel and in becoming him became his husband and didn't really enter the world so much as entered the world as sort of his, um, uh, you know, partner. The third uh, group is Marianne and Sarah Myers. I don't know much about them. But they came from a rich family, uh, had an aristocratic education, and they both married well, namely um, non-Jewish aristocrats, and thus were able to reside in the great world. Um, th the point is that for all of these individual Jews, they are cases of women who understood how to erase the traces um, left behind of being Jews. They understood how to escape from being Jews or escape from Judaism, as, our, as Rahel put it. Now, Rahel, who's the person that, uh, is, that is most famous for this and for whom Arendt writes the most about, um, on the one hand, seemed like she succeeded, right? She, she had a salon, and then when the salon broke apart, she married well and uh, has remained a public figure. But as RN says at the top of 25, what is sure is that she was never able to erase the traces, to deny practically her origins, although it was she who made the angriest and bitterest remarks about her Jewishness. And here's part of the problem with assimilation. It's a kind of self-hatred. It's a kind of, in order to be an assimilated Jew, you have to hate yourself. I mean, this is... I mean, you have to understand, this is Arendt writing this in 1932, right? At a time in which she's about to, one year later, be arrested and flee Germany. This is a time in which someone who grew up thinking, you know, she, Jewishness was not a huge part of her life is suddenly confronted with the rise of the Nazi party. And this question of, does she want to be a Jew or not? And her answer, as many of you know, is if you're attacked as a Jew, you have to defend yourself as a Jew. And that's part of her insistence that we not fully assimilate but it's also that assimilation is a faustian bargain to assimilate means to reject part of who you are and um and just to hate to, to engage in a kind of self-hatred um rahel uh unlike henrietta hertz was not beautiful this is rn saying this and and it's what um rahel says about herself so it's not me saying it uh, was not beautiful, was not educated, had no cultural world, really had nothing to distinguish her. Um, um, the one thing uh, she seemed to have is wit and an ability to um, look at the world in an unprejudiced way, uh, an unburdened manner of seeing. And in doing so, um, uh, was able to break into the European world, the non-Jewish world, by being interesting, right? By being witty, by speaking in a way that made people attend to her, made her appear. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, for Arendt, the, 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 what enabled her to do this as an uneducated, um, not really distinctive person was her profound reading and influence by Goethe that gave her a language and a way of communicating um, in which she could um, say things that made people take her seriously. Um, just like Wilhelm Meister, uh, Goethe's character in, in, the, in the education of Wilhelm Meister, um, uh, is, in, is, in, is a sort of Un, unobtrusive nobody who through education becomes a somebody. Um, uh, Rahel is someone who became a somebody be, through her education in reading Goethe and allowed her to break into what Arendt calls the reality of the world. The last part of this essay, which I think is fascinating and it's interesting, I'm teaching a course on citizenship now and it's quite interesting that Arendt doesn't I mean, she obviously writes a lot about action and what it means to be a citizen in many ways, but she doesn't talk about citizenship that much in her writing, at least, I, you know, I'm trying to think about it and maybe some of you can recall some, some passages on it. But here you have in 1933, um, uh, a passage on 
what a citizen is. And she says, the bearers of the enlightenment, whose continuation is romanticism, are the citizens. The citizens are enlightened subjects. The citizens are those people who have no prejudices, who are, in a sense, equal, right? The whole premise of citizenship is everyone is equal in a social world. There's no aristocrats, there's no Jews, there's no Christians, there's no aristocrats, there's no laborers. We're all citizens. And um, we don't belong to social rank. We don't represent anything. The citizen in us is only what we have. And so in one way, Wilhelm Meister before his education and Jews as educated, enlightened bearers of the enlightenment are the quintessential citizens. This is, I think, a, a fascinating point that Arendt is making here, that um, Jews become the quintessential citizens as the sort of nobodies, the people who are overlooked, assimilated Jews become the quintessential citizens because they're simply the plain enlightened subjects. Um, but in the world of the citizen, she says, uh, there emerges the fear of not being seen, of having no endorsement of one's reality. And this is the way Herder saw the Jews, right? They're these enlightenment subjects that are cut off from their history and yet are not yet part of European history. They're sort of nobodies. Um, and if Wilhelm Meister sought to do this through education to become a person, um, Rahel von Hagen and Henrietta Hetzer sought to do it through the salons. And Dorothea Schlegel and the Myers uh, sought to do it through marriage. Um, and so at the end of this essay, she says the salon is Rahel's social opportunity and justification. She finds in it the foundation upon which she can live, the space wherein she is socially recognized. The salon is her social reality. Only when the salon disappears, because modern anti-Semitism reappears and Jews are now shunned in a social world, um, does Rahel have to seek another way of meaning, of being more than a mere citizen, a public person? And that's when she marries um, uh, Von Hagen and converts to Christianity. All right, so um, I'm gonna stop there. I mean, you know, the, 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 the other essays here, um, I thought the guide for youth on Martin Buber was quite interesting. Um, I guess the, the the most fascinating part about it was was just, I mean, that her 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 her, her interest in Buber um, as a leader or guide or spiritual guide, um, as she puts it on the top of page thirty three, who would lead the Jews back to Hebrew, the language of the Bible. The most important thing he did, amongst the many things he did, she said, was translate the Bible into German in a way that allowed assimilated Jews who didn't know Hebrew and didn't know the Bible to reclaim their history, to, to learn in a way, told it in a way that would make them understand themselves as Jews again. Um, not to turn them, say you have to go back and learn Hebrew and, and be, you know, religious, but to give them stories that would allow them to find some pride and spirit, a po what she calls also a positive Judaism. And so um, you can clearly see this, you know, she's at the, at this point in 32, she's what, 26 years old, um, clearly looking for a positive Judaism. Um the next essay, the last one we read today, some young people are going home. By the way, both the Buber essay and this essay are now written in 1935, three years after the last two. She's now in Paris and writing in, in I believe in French. I don't actually know if these were written in French. I think they were, they were in French journals. Um, and, uh, and, and, and here she's talking about the youth and the, uh, the Youth Aliyah, which is an organization she worked for, where she took uh, Palestinian youth to Palestine um, uh, in order to, to save them, uh, but also, as she says here, um, to discover again the joy, dignity of youth that will help rebuild the country, right? Eretz Israel, uh, the home of Israel. 
So you're seeing here her here at her most Zionist in some ways, um, and uh, and engaging in actual. How do I, as a young 26 year old German Jew who was arrested and fled and is in exile, um, deal with my Judaism? I and mean, these are the questions she's asking herself um, at this part of her life. All right, I'm going to stop there uh, and open it up to questions. As you all know, there's two ways to engage in the discussion here. One is in the um, chat. Is the chat working? I hope. Yeah, everyone and anyone directly. Um, and uh, you can do that. Please be respectful uh, in the chat. You can also raise your hand and uh, ask your question in person. Um, uh, I'm not getting much in the chat. Is the chat on or just not people that interested in today? Is it working? There's one question uh, about real assimilation versus ideology of assimilation. Okay, I mean, I'll just I'll just maybe say something quickly about that to the extent I can. And I mean, I don't know if she uses the words real assimilation and ideological ideology of assimilation. What she says is that, oh, I see. When I said assimilation is a fact, namely that Jews did um, uh, assimilate by becoming bearers of the Enlightenment. Um, if you, you know, when you look at the four examples that she talks about, Rahel, Henrietta, Dorothea, and the Meyer sisters, um, that's facts. They did. The ideology is simply the idea that one ought to do this and that one has to do this in order to, um, uh, you know, become a good, good German or a good European. Um, uh when she says that the ideology can no longer be maintained because re reality has refuted it, you know, I think she's talking about the fact that I didn't mention this, but the, you know, at, a big part of RN's interest in Rahel is that on her deathbed, the last thing she she said was, "The one thing that I would never trade, uh, give up, is the one thing I spent my life trying to give up, which is that I was born a Jew." Right, and 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 for Arendt, this 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 is a refutation of the ideology of of enlightenment. I mean, I'm, I'm of assimilation, right? That that it leads to this kind of incredible denial of the self. Um, on the side of the Jews. On the other hand, reality is refuted it because of Nazism and anti-Semitism. And that every time Jews try and assimilate, what happens again? Anti-Semitism emerges. Um, and and it and it just doesn't work. So so that's the that's the claim she's making there. All right, I'll go to the hands up and and Jana, if there are questions in the chat maybe you can that you want to think we you want to raise you can bring them up if that's okay um james you're up uh unmute yourself james i can't hear you i feel so stupid what is the difference between what we're talking about and balls on racism <laughs> um you're not stupid. I think that's a question that has been debated for a long time. And um, so let me say, Arendt argues that anti-Semitism is simply racism. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, if you read her work on anti-Semitism, and as we will in this book, you'll see that she argues that anti-Semitism is an ideological a belief in the superiority of one group and their right to rule, kill, or enslave another group. Um, that's what she thinks racism is. Um, by the way, she agrees in this with someone named Ibram Kendi, who's written a lot about racism, who says that exactly what Arendt says about anti-Semitism, he says about racism, right? He they both say anti-Semitism is not Jew hatred, racism is not hatred of Blacks or whatever race. It is an ideological justification for oppression, genocide, and slavery post facto. That's what they think racism is. Both Arendt in Judaism and Ankendi in 
in, in black racism, anti-black racism in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, and so uh, Arendt largely reads this as racism. Now, I'll just be very clear and, 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 and about this. There are many people today who think that Arendt didn't understand racism, especially anti-black racism. And they argue that her, that the attempt to take what she took to be anti-Semitism and apply it in her, in her understanding of racism in the United States was a mistake and a failure. Um, and, uh, and I think there's a lot of, we can, there's a lot to say about that. And, 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 and it's a, an important discussion to have both as an Arendt group and um, in general, in our attempt to understand both anti-Semitism and racism, to ask is, to what extent they're similar or different. Is this what we she refers to as, quote, the Jewish question? Well, the Jewish question, um, which is what the title of the first essay we read that we read last week was, right? The Jewish question. Yep. The, or the Enlightenment and the Jewish question, um, you know, has existed for 2000 well, more than 2,000 years, but let's say around 2,000 years. And um, the Jewish question, but she says that the Jewish question changed, right? It changed after the Enlightenment. That's part of the arguments of these texts. Or at first, the Jewish question was a religious question. It was a creedal question of the conflict between different religions. And... Um, and as a result, you know, people didn't like each other because they had different creeds and they had different religions, but it was it was limited to that. And it might lead to violence, it might lead to, to wars, but it wasn't ideological. It was religious. The argument she's making in these texts and that she makes more fully in Origins of Totalitarianism and other books is that um, modern anti-Semitism is not creedal, is not religious, is not about actually the hatred of Jews. Most people who are radical anti-Semites almost never encounter a Jew, right? It's an ideology of uh, elevation and subordination. It's an ideology of oppression um, that uh, is based on uh, a racial or religious or however you want to call it category. Um, and so uh, the Jewish question in the post-Enlightenment era is the racial question. That's how she understands it. Not cultural. I mean, the Jewish culture is such a rich, physical, deep, profound culture. Yeah, that's true. So are many cultures, right? But the point is the reason people, the reason that the Jews had, that Jewish assimilation failed is because in the end, Jews were Jews. That's right, but they weren't Christians. They weren't Christians, they were Jews. And as a result, That's no matter true. how much they assimilated, they couldn't be Christians. Christian. That's couldn't the be. point. Oh. Know, who's, someone's okay. talking, but I can't tell who. It's um, not Anna Rubenstein. Oh, hi. Hi. So, you know, just give me a second to finish, and then, because it's hard to hear two people. Sorry. Um, so, the point is, it was the racial aspect. It, maybe you don't like the word race here. The national aspect of the Jewish question um, that was the problem. Because no matter what they did, they were still Jews, both in their own fear that they couldn't get rid of it and in other people's assertion that they were. That's You can call that national. You can call that racial. Call it whatever you want. But I don't think it's just, I don't think it's what you mean by cultural. Anna, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you want to add something to what I said? Well, I feel very strongly um, that, uh, well, you know, you were talking about how citizens were simply uh, private citizens and who they were, but the Jews of all the citizens didn't fit in, obviously because they were not Christian, because Europe was Christian. And I think Arendt's weakness, mm -hmm. particular, all, all throughout, was her inability to bring religion realistically into the mix. And that creed uh, did not disappear at all. 
and that um, the Nazis in their pagan uh, fight were in fact uh, continuing a very anti-Christian, but still rooted in Christianity war. And um, so, you know, this absence of bringing Christianity, even in your comments, when you talk about citizenship, she's 26. I found I found this this essay um, because I just finished reading The Jew is Pariah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, her her thesis is very simple. A Jew can be a. Uh, a, 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 what is it, a counter, a counter, a parvenu or a pariah, you know, for those who don't know, a parvenu is someone, as parvenu is like a newly, like a new bourgeoisie, like a, you know, someone who makes it suddenly in the world, and she says there's really only two options. Desperate assimilationists, desperate assimilationists, I suppose, but in any event, that's the point, I mean, I feel very strongly about it, and my father wrote about it quite a bit, um, he, he, in his work, uh, Richard Rubenstein. Um, and um, so I've been really reading all of uh, Arendt and that, that is just something that struck me right now. Good. Um, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, I mean, just on the citizenship question, I mean, what she's saying is that in, if I, it's just so I'm clear that in my mind, what she's saying is that to be a citizen for everybody is to be sort of a no one, um, to be equal. And on the one hand, she's saying Jews are the epitome of citizens because they have to give up their inequality, their Judaism, in order to be citizens. And yet um, that's impossible. And thus they become subject of anti-Semitism because they still are Jews. Um, that's what I take to be her argument ab about that. Um, I feel it's a weak argument. It's sort of a specious argument because what is it saying? It's not saying anything. Well, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I love her rent, but that's not saying no. anything. Well, it, I mean, I think it's saying something about the problem of assimilation. But that's, I mean, that's what we're trying, that's what she's trying to say something about Without here. Without bringing why they are the least, why they are, uh, if everybody is, uh, if everybody loses their individuality and they're simply private citizens, then why aren't Jews just the same? I mean, it's, it's too obvious. Okay. Um, well, let's see if I can keep thinking about that and, and see. <laughs> I, I mean, I, again, I, yeah. Um, I think she's saying something quite not something about the the same. I think she's saying there's something that there's a unique predicament that Jews have. I mean, it's a it's a predicament that many other a number of other German Jew, German Jewish writers wrote about. And by the way, it's very similar, I think, to something like the double consciousness of Du Bois and and other people who who write about such things. Um, and I think she's you know, writing in 1930, already articulating a lot of these ideas. Um, okay, I have that, plenty to learn, I'm sure. Yeah. No, and I do too. I mean, look, this is not this is not my specialty in our end, but I'm I'm interested in it, so always good. All right, let's go on, uh, Max. Hi, Roger. Thanks for that uh, introduction. So I'm just struggling with this this um, problem that Arendt has with assimilation. I'm currently studying multiculturalism, uh, sort of on the ground. And I was in a small town in Birmingham called Small Heath. And Small Heath over the past 30, 40 years has seen massive Islamic migration. And, and I was there a few weeks ago. And it was, it was literally like stepping into a different country. There was, I was there for maybe an hour. I saw maybe two or three sort of white British people. Um, even the dress is different. I, I was in a few bookstores and I was talking to one bookstore owner and he was telling me that a lot of um, Muslims are migrating from Europe to Small Heath because Britain is seen as much more religiously liberal. So that was one bookstore that I went to. Then I went to a different bookstore, a Salafi bookstore, um, which is much more conservative in its 
um, religious teaching of Islam. And it, it just felt so different. And what I'm, what I'm trying to understand is how would Arendt approach this um, issue? Because there is the issue of, of Islamism uh, in these communities. And there is a real tension between the majority community of, of, of English people, which basically fled that, that town, and then the, the Islamic religion and, and, and the Muslims in the town. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to bring a rent into this. Thank you, Max. It's a great question. And uh, Anne brought up this other essay, right? The Jewish pariah. It's not the only one. But RN is going to talk a lot about these kind of questions around Judaism, right? Uh, in this book. And, and we'll have a hopefully have a lot of time to talk about this and, and, and raise the question. So I want to do two things. I want to, first of all, repeat something I said in response to James, which is RN is writing about Judaism. As Anne says, not everyone agrees with her about Judaism, right? I mean, I don't know if she's right. I mean, I think she's interesting. I think she says things that make me think, but okay. Can we apply it to assimilation questions around gay and lesbian assimilation or transgender assimilation or black, white assimilation or Muslim assimilation? You know, these are fraught questions. Let's just start yeah. there. And there's always going to be differences. I don't want to ever deny that, right? And so, um, you know, I think, you know, one thing to say is just because Arendt wrote this about Jews, whether or not it's right about Jews doesn't mean it's right about Muslim assimilation in 60 years, 170, no, almost 90 years later in, in the UK. Um, you know, having said that, uh, I think Arendt is one of many people who've grappled with this question of double consciousness, assimilation, um, uh, et cetera. So on one hand, I think there's a lot of people who've written about that. I mean, in, in all sorts of areas of race and assimilation. There's another element that I think RN um, grapples with in a way that not as many people have, um, which is the, and this is, goes back to RN as a thinker of distinctions, right? Um, so she'll distinguish different kinds of anti-Semitism. We haven't gotten into that yet. Not only modern and ancient anti-Semitism, but she'll distinguish social anti-Semitism and political anti-Semitism. And we and we'll we'll start to see the differences in those. Um, and and I think that that can be a very valuable um, lens in which to understand some of these things. So she'll say that social discrimination, which is discrimination, can be uncomfortable, but it's not dangerous. Whereas she'll say political discrimination is both uncomfortable and dangerous, right? A distinction she makes. Some people will hate this distinction. Some people might like it. She'll also make a distinction between what she calls race thinking or prejudice and racism. And she'll say that not all race thinking is racist. Not all talking about Jews right. and making distinctions between Jews and non-Jews is racial or anti-Semitic. It only right. becomes racial or anti-Semitic when it becomes ideological and when it includes an invidious kind of distinction, right? These are complicated distinctions. And I think what the, the way Arendt can be useful to someone like you in trying to study contemporary examples is that if you look at these distinctions and you try and understand them without simply saying, oh my God, we can't do this, right? You can then ask, are they meaningful in the, in the world that I'm looking at? Are they meaningful in I, I, the, the small heath or whatever, the town you're talking about? Yeah. Do they help me understand something that maybe if I hadn't had these distinctions, I wouldn't have understood? Right. That to me is, is the way I would approach um, uh, some of these, you know, the, the way I would say our rent can be useful in thinking about modern questions of anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim sentiment, or, or the, or, or the or, or self-segregation of Muslims, or Muslim ghettos, 
however you you know there's there's all ways to put it but that's what you're talking about yeah um and uh and so that's what i would do is i'd look to rent for these distinctions and try and take them seriously not to defend our end because that's not shouldn't, shouldn't be any of our views right or any of our points mm -hmm. but to see is it helpful in making so, sense so, and meaning of the world we live in so it's basically like you know walking a tightrope i mean these things are so fraught and complex and i will show some of my work to some of my colleagues and they'll say oh that's just islamophobic so sometimes i feel like i'm sort of going crazy yeah well, I think I think to have these conversations is going to be hard, no matter where you are or with whom you are. Um, and the only way to have them is with goodwill and with an attention to trying to understand each other. And if you take your goal as trying to confront reality as it is mm -hmm. and understand it, as she says she's trying to do, right? To comprehend, understanding is to comprehend reality in all of its horrors and then to resist it, but first try and understand it. And if you so, take that approach, I think you can find common ground with people. Because so the, if you're honest, you'll always see, you'll always look at it from both sides. So Go the ahead. Issue that I'm, I'm, the, the issue that I'm really struggling with is the, is the terrorism example and and dealing with like security services so you'll have mi5 will infiltrate certain salapi groups um to try and stop terrorism and in order to do that you have to implement something the prevent program which is what the uk is doing at the moment um and this is political legislation being put forward to monitor certain groups legally with uh, sort of experts and everything behind it yeah. um, and then some people will say this whole legal apparatus shouldn't be there, it's racist it's, yeah. it's bigot, it's, it's discriminatory um, but it, 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 it's needed, I mean if you don't do these sort of political works and have these security apparatus how, you know, how do you know who's going to how do you know how to foil a, a terror attack so, so how would she deal with these 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 sort of extremist elements or what were you going to say anyway? sorry so, so so first of all actually, i can't answer all these questions you know i don't i don't know if i know all the answers to all these questions like i i'm not hannah arendt i don't know how she would address all these questions yes. um uh you know i think like i said hannah arendt is meaningful to me because she helps me <laughs> ask questions not always answer them um so on a question of security Right. One question Hannah Arendt would make me ask is what's more valuable, security or freedom? Right. What's more valuable, security or equality? Now, that's not an answer. That's a question. And I'm not telling you what the answer is. It, but I am saying she would make you ask that question and make say, well, people say, oh, we need this for security. Well, what is security? And how much security? And can we live a free life? with the promise of complete security? Probably not. That I think I'll say. And, and so these are the kind of questions that I think are helpful in, in, in reading her work and pushing back on, on these things. And yet she'll also say, right, that in order to live a meaningful life, you need some consistency and some security and some hope that tomorrow will continue to exist. Otherwise you can't keep living. You have to have some continuity. And that you have to have some hope that the world will endure. And so security is not meaningless. That doesn't maybe answer your question for you, but I'm not going to, I can't. No, I, I know. You, I can you just put say me that in the right direction anyway. You put me in the right direction. All right. I hope that's helpful. Um, Thank you. Thank you very this much. Will keep, this will keep coming up. I mean, especially when we write, we, we talk a little bit, we read some of the essays on Palestine, right? And 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 terror you know it's these the questions are going to come up in this book so we'll come back to them okay uh susan i have two questions one is um well maybe it's a comment on her statement on page 25 
that Rahel had no tradition had passed anything on to her. No history foresaw her existence and that she was born into no cultural world. And I, I think sort of uh, similar to Hannah's statement earlier, I, I just find that um, hard to swallow, exactly. I guess. Exactly. Um, because um, having come from um, tradition of German Jewish immigrants in the US, um, they did all kinds of assimilation, but they never denied their Jewishness or gave that up. And we even see the example of the Moranos in Spain who uh, had to hide their Jewishness. So I really question um, that claim um, that- so just, quick, just quickly, you know, we read, I, I think you were with us when we read the Von Hagen book. I, I mean, was. it's not here. This is a short essay, but this is what Rahel Von Hagen says about herself, right? This is her claim about herself, right? She, and you said they didn't deny their Judaism. Some, of course, some people didn't. Rahel did. For much of her life, she said, my Judaism is the worst thing that I have to, exp I have to expunge it. So Arendt is talking about a very particular example, which she sees as exemplary. And you may say, oh, it's not exemplary, but she's trying to say, look, in these, in looking at someone like Rahel, we can learn something that's not true for everybody, but we can see, um, we can see desires that are often, that are here radicalized and extremized that are maybe in other people. And that's what she's trying to do with Rahel. I would say that it, if it took so much work for Rahel to do that, <laughs> It meant that there was a lot there that she had to get rid of. So, yeah, I, well, I, I think guess, that's, you know, what, that's, also, that's also a good point. And that's part of Aaron's point, right? Which is that that's why assimilation, she says, is impossible. Yeah. 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 The other question, I think I heard you say that Rahel's um, experience in the salons gave her a public uh, life. And I just wondered about that as compared to a social as Arendt would see it, um, experience. How is that public and not social um, in Arendt's categories? It would be social, but in this case, um, you're, you're right. In, in sort of the public, social, private, it would be social. Uh, but the social at this point is at least not the private. And it thus gives her a, 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 an existence in a world outside of herself and her family that's the that's the claim so it's um it's not public in the sense of political uh, action but it is public in the sense that she um has a stage or a persona uh in in a world that is taken seriously by others and specifically those others she wants to be seen by namely the aristocracy and the cultured elite so you're right it's uh it's a social and and like I've always said, all these distinctions, public, social, private, are always fluid and and um, and you know we should never we should understand them, but we should also realize that at times the social can be public and at times the social can be private. Um, they're not supposed to be hard categories. Okay. Bill, how are you? Bill, uh, you got you're muted, I believe. No, I'm I'm not good. Uh, I'm uh, sitting on my hand, so to speak. Um, when I heard when you proposed that we were going to be reading the Jewish writings, uh, I thought my first response was, "This is not for me." I thought that it would make me a voyeur, um, and that you folks need to like talk among yourselves. You see, I make this assumption that most people on the call are Jewish, which is totally wrong, I know. But now I'm, I'm so glad that I did it. Um, I, I'll just, an anecdote. I, I'm so full of feeling right now that I have to speak in anecdotes. Uh, back in the day, uh, I don't know if people on the call know who I am or they know about my famous collaboration with Arnie Zane, um, whose mother was Edith Zacklin, uh, who came from a rabbi's family. She married a Brazilian man. Uh, who converted to Judaism. Arnie, uh, at the end of his life, he died um, complications from AIDS in 1988 in this very room I'm sitting in. Um, he, wrote, uh, he wore a 
uh, Star of David and a cr Christian cross trying to get to some place. I say this only because I'm not sure why the Museum of Natural History did this, but uh, anybody on the phone, dance aficionados, do you know who Pearl Lang was? Pearl Lang was a celebrated dancer in Martha Graham's earlier companies. And she did a, a much respected work based on, and I never saw another butterfly, which as you know, was the writing of the kids at Theresienstadt. And so she made this piece. Well, um, they pulled together what was supposed to have been a kind of a symposium on blacks and Jews. This is around the time, I believe, of Bensonhurst that, uh, and maybe somebody wants to take us back there, what that was, an ugly confrontation around race. And, and it was most clear that Jews were not, um, was not in the mind of the people writing about it in New York, was not a racial category. It was something else. Well, the question was Blacks and Jews who have successfully worked together. Arnie was already dead. Um, I do remember that when I left that, that day, first of all, I was the only Black person in the room, which has been the story of my life. Um, uh, and I said to myself, oh, why didn't I ask the question? Are Jews white people? And last week, I noticed um, uh, Roger, it got something in our thinking or your thinking, you, uh, you're talking about this question of assimilation and you said it is a, I don't know, you didn't say it was a guilty question, but had contemporary uh, educated, let's say people on this call, have you made the, the change? I mean, are you now assimilated? And does that, and you said your words, I think you said, are Jews white people? Hmm. So that's, one of my responses to uh, this conversation, because I think it's very, my feelings are so crass right now. It's literally, I'm still quaking from George Floyd. I'm still at all of that. So it, I'm, I lack generosity sometime and I'm, I'm privileged to sit and listen to how people talk about things that I feel some of us uh, who are quote, integrated Blacks, and that's another thing I'd love the group to take on. What's the distinction between integration and assimilation? They yeah. fed us integration, right? Nobody told me that I could assimilate into American society. So the frustration I think that Anne is expressing something is that let's face it, you know, some people, who, who gets to decide who is and is not in the group? Mm -hmm. And that comes back to the crude question white people and then another question who owned the enlightenment whose ideas were they white people now is that a crude way to put it no. uh, again and, and, and if that's the case then we have a whole other adjustment to the conversation what club do you want to be in hmm. and what's wrong with you uh negroes or you uh children of israel and i had a foot doctor tell me once Oh, you know, uh, Bill, I'm sorry, don't take this the wrong way, but Black people like the children of Israel have naturally flat feet. Uh, mm -hmm. this, so all of this, I, I'm saying a lot of stuff right now, but it's, I'm trying to catch up emotionally in what we're talking about. What is this? Are we, in fact, are Jews finally assimilated? And if you're assimilated, are you white? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I, I don't think I completely, I got everything, but that this question of integration and assimilation, I do think would be worth chewing on a bit. Thanks a lot, Roger. No, thank you, Bill. And thanks for telling some of those stories, which are great and thoughtful. Um, I'd love to go back. I, want, I wonder if that panel, I never saw another butterfly or, 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 Jew, or the Blacks and Jews at the His Museum was, was taped. I'd love to see that. Um, there's two, there's a couple of things I wanted to say. I mean, and first of all, let me say other people can chime in, right? <laughs> I'm not speaking for all white people and I'm not speaking for all Jews. Um, certainly, nor am I speaking for Hannah Arendt on these questions. Um, I thought one thing I'll say is I think the distinction between integration and assimilation is a, is a meaningful one. Um, you know, I think one of the, when I said before that there's a real question of, Arendt saw the Jewish question as a question of race. And I think there's been a criticism recently that 
she didn't understand race. Now, one, one level of that criticism, which she herself wrote, and so she admits this and she knows it, but it's there, is that simply on a physical level, it may be harder for um, blacks to assimilate than white than Jews, uh, to take an example, or than than um, than gays. Uh, or it just may be easier for certain people to assimilate because there's less of a physical um, daily uh, reminder of difference. Uh, to go back to something Anne said and 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 go to you, and so this may be a way of thinking about the difference in integration and assimilation. Um, I hadn't, I have, I don't know. Um, you know, you also raised the question of is the Enlightenment white? Um, uh, which I, I is a is a question that, for those of you who are in the academic world, know, is a burning question in the <laughs> academic world uh, around um, decolonization of of the syllabus and decolonization of 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 of, of what we read and teach, um, and so. You know, is is the Enlightenment white is is something that that a lot of people are talking about. Um, you know, interestingly enough, uh, you know, there are, there are many of the many great Enlightenment thinkers um, were not at least traditionally European white. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, what does that mean? Uh, I'm not going to say I'm not going to try to answer it. I think these are good questions, and I hope that over the next months of reading this, we'll keep coming back to them. On the question of our Jews white, which is a question that I've been, you know, you said I formulated last week somewhat carefully. Like it's a question that's being asked a lot. Um, you know, uh, there's a there's a book that came out a, about a year ago that I thought was a very good book called Jews Don't Count. Um, uh, that argues that basically Jews are the one group now that doesn't count as a minority. Um, there are a lot of uh, groups that argue that um, Jews don't count in the sense that they're now white and therefore have assimilated to being white and therefore discrimination against Jews doesn't matter to the same extent it matters against other people because they're white, which also suggests that discrimination against white people doesn't matter, which I think is a problematic assumption. Um, I, I think I can only say as a Jew um, and as someone who I trained to think about these issues, whether I'm a Jew or not, um, the unfathomable rise of anti-Semitism again in the last seven years, alongside racism, uh, suggests to me that Jews are not white, at least in the way that racists see Jews. Um, uh, if you look at the websites of many of the right supremacists and neo-Nazi groups in this country, there's more anti-Semitic vitriol on them than there is anti-Black vitriol on them. That's not a trying to be competitive. I'm just saying the anti, the racist arguments that racists in this country make are still spoken in the language of anti-Semitism. And if you take the, the mantra of Arendt's, which I generally think is right and important, which is if you're attacked as a Jew, defend yourself as a Jew. Clearly, racists don't think Jews are white. And uh, and as a result, I find it very dangerous. And I also find it wrong uh, when I hear many of my colleagues say Jews have become white um, and therefore discrimination against Jews doesn't matter anymore. Um, and so that said, as Jew, who largely lives his life not having to think very much about his Judaism if I don't want to. In my liberal world, I don't encounter that very much. I have to, you know, I'll be very honest. And yet in this country, I can't yet but be aware that it exists. Um, and then, you know, and I have to deal with that tension too. Um, I don't know. I. I don't have the answers to these questions, Bill. I think they're great questions. If you want to respond, you can. If other people want to jump in here, they can. Because but but, uh, but let's let's get a little funkier with it. Good. I want to get. Is funky. anybody concerned with the size of your dick? 
Is anybody concerned with the fact that if they breed with you, their children are going to be less intelligent? Is anybody concerned that to be around you, you are more violent? You don't have, it. I mean, I'm saying it, there's, well, I think a, there's, there's a level at which the ra that racism has, I'm now feeling like a pariah. I mean, you even told me when I questioned um, Hannah Arendt saying to James Baldwin at the end of his essay, when he said the world needs more, we need more love in the discourse. And she said, well, excuse me, but may I just intercede and say something to you effect, you know, you should never bring in love, you know? Uh, and, uh, and I said that to you and you said, well, if you read the essay, it was Lessing essay, right? Which I did not read. Um, pariah people of which blacks and Jews are, should never allow their quote opponents to, uh, to change a discourse to be one about love. It should always, you don't, you're not concerned about what your opponents are feeling, you're concerned about what they are thinking and doing. So I, uh, it's, I don't think it's so easy to say that, um, uh, that we're all, that, that sounds like we're having a group now, uh, brothers and sisters sitting around talking as pariahs, mm -hmm. right? I see the temperature in the group went up, people's hackles got up, pain is there. Right, this is old, it's deep and I feel it. But is that what's going on right now? That we're all the same in our suffering. It, well, it was victim art is what I had directed at me, right? You're all victims, right? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pleased. No, I, think, I think it's important, you know, cause what I wanna say is obviously anti-Semitism is gonna have different discriminations and different assumptions than anti-black racism, right? Um, it may not be the size of your dick. It may be the size of your nose. Yeah. It, it, it may not, it, it, you know, it, it, it may be, it may not be, you know, you're dangerous physically, but you're dangerous economically and you're going to cheat and steal now. And I'm not trying to equate those. In fact, I think they're different and we should understand the differences. And I would, and this is what I've tried to say a couple times today is I think it's a question, not an answer. I don't think, I think Arendt hoped and thought that racism, qua racism, could be understood the same way Judaism, black racism. I don't think that's the case. That's part of what I'm saying. That you have to look at them differently. That said, um, I think that there is real racism against Jews today, anti-Semitism, whatever you want to call it. I'm not trying to say it's the same as racism against black. I certainly don't think it impacts me as much as I hear you being impacted by it. Um, uh, I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm wary of the hierarchy of who's oppressed more. I, I think there's obvious, I think racism, black, anti-black racism is a much bigger problem in the, in the United States today than anti-Semitism. I do think that, but um, I think they're both real. And, uh, and, um, and I think we need to think about them pretty deeply. Uh, and I don't, and while I think it's an, you know, one can ask, are Jews white? Um, you know, there are plenty of books written about are certain blacks white, right? Um, on all sorts of, as you said, assimilation and, and integration grounds. Uh, and I, I think that there's some ways in which those are intellectually interesting arguments and they can also be pretty offensive. Um, uh, so I just, I, I'm wary about, um, I, 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 I don't know. To me, the Jews are white people argument generally comes from the place of discrimination and oppression of Jews doesn't matter. I don't think that's what you're saying at all. I know that's not what you're saying. It's not, it's not. Yeah. No, I know. I'm just saying, but that's the danger of the, sometimes you and I, you know, you've said this to me. I know you're not saying this, but that's the danger of the words you're using. I remember, and you know, I mean, I think the the Jews are Jews are just white people. I think is potentially um, taking away our view from real, meaningful anti-Semitism and oppression in the world that need to be taken seriously, but are different from, and I don't think as much of a problem in our world today as anti-black racism. Hey, Roger, can I chime in a bit? Yeah, I mean, we, I know there's. There's about 12 minutes left. 
Jerry is waiting. Jerry, do you want to jump in on this before I let other people jump in on it? I just want to make sure you have a chance to say something if you want to. Jerry, you got to unmute yourself. You're muted. Jerry, are you there? I can't, I can't hear you. Looks like he is unmuted, but we can't hear him. His microphone might be off. I don't know. All right. Jerry, see if you can get your <laughs> mic back on. Are you there? No. All right. Um, who else, who wanted to jump in? I wanted to just say something really quickly. Who's that? Adolfo? Yeah. Yeah, Adolfo, go ahead. So I, I was just saying in terms of in terms of uh, Oh, you're breaking up Adolfo, I, and that kind of thing. Adolfo. I think that I mean can you hear me? You're, yeah, that's good. Try Hello? that. Try it now. Okay, perfect. So I think that one concept that I think maybe we should try to bring into this, you know, like some folks may think that this is a bit cold, but like to really think about like the, the idea of a spectator and assimilation. So it seems like, so we, we did all this reading about the spectator and the history, and now we're being faced with the Jewish question, assimilation. And the question, I think one of the biggest question is, who is the spectator, the true spectator of Jewish assimilation? Who is the true spectator of black racism? Like, have we arrived at a certain kind of spectator or even thought about those questions to even begin to think about the comparisons because it, it, it's it's almost like I mean you, you think about a guy like Du Bois but sometimes you think about like is Du Bois is Du Bois a spectator of his own assimilation to which he provides a vocabulary or is he a, a, a spectator of black assimilation which is a ton of of human beings and it's the same question with with Jewish assimilation so I, I do think that in order to be rigorous, we should also ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a spectator of assimilation? I, I, think, I think that's an excellent question. I mean, and I thought what you said about is Du Bois talking about his own assimilation or the, all of black people, it's a, it's a fascinating and important question. And clearly the same can be asked of Arendt talking about assimilation for Jews. Um, uh, you know, I think that in both cases, they're looking at their experience and the experience of people who've written to try and find uh, insights and feelings and expressions that they think have meaning for other people. Um, and how do we, who is viewing it? Is it other black people? Is it certain kinds of black people? Is it white people, certain kinds of Jewish people, all Jewish people? Um, and, and that's why, you know, to go back to something I was thinking about when Max was asking about his attempt to understand this town in Birmingham, you know, these things are so ridiculously complicated and nuanced, and yet we have this desire right now to have right answers or right opinions. This is this, this is that, this is anti-Semitic, this is racist or not. And an important, look, judgments are important. We need to make judgments, and yet we also need to um, uh, you know, try and, 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 and widen our perspective and, and understand that these things, that who the spectator is, who the actors are matter. And so I think what you're saying, Adolfo, makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, it's one of the reasons we have to have these kind of difficult conversations about anti-Semitism or racism or whatever it is, and yet they're hard. Um, Roger, may I jump in for a moment? Yeah, who's that? Uh, John, John. John. we got about eight, nine minutes left. So if I could ask people to keep their comments short at this point, because I think there's a bunch of people who want to say things. Two things. One, there's a distortedness to this discussion in my mind, because we're only talking about the Ashkenazi group and it's Eastern European Jews. We're leaving out a whole coterie of African Jews who are in their heritage were Jewish and have been Jewish and were and the Sephardic sect. So 
Um, I don't even, the question, one of the questions, what was Hannah Arendt's definition of a Jew? Well, you're, it's a good point, John, because there's also, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but increasing numbers of Jews in the United States and in Israel are Jews of color. 13%. Uh, 13%. There you go. I don't know the numbers. Um, so, you know, that's the question of are Jews white also has a very different valence for Jews of color. Um, although some would say not. Some would, you know, I mean, some would say no, it doesn't matter. At least as a Jew, you're white. Um, I, I, I'm just saying what I've heard. And, but it is, it does change the valence and it, and it raises good issues. Um, other people who want to jump in here, I just want to make sure we get a bunch of opinions. Bjorn, did you want to say something? Yes, I was struggling with uh, integration, acceptance, and assimilation mm. as words, because uh, assimilation, in a way, I understand and I would like clarification as erasure of the specifics in order to become part of whatever one assimilates in. Yes. Integration and acceptance seem to be kind of hand in hand. You can integrate into another group without losing maybe yeah. your specificities. Right. And the values of the enlightenment, as I understand them, were more values of acceptance of diversity at their core, with, of course, the limitation of an 18th or 17th century thinker as to what was acceptable. And we've broadened those views nowadays, but uh, on racial, sexual, whatever uh, uh, level. So, so this question of, I, I, I have a problem with also the examples of an, uh, of an assimilated person as equated with denier of what um, would make one not be assimilated. And in a way, I wonder if it is that the onus is put on the victim, I'm sorry for the term, the term is poor, uh, on the minority person in her discourse, as opposed to scrutinizing it from the majority, i.e. is it the role of the one who wants to be assimilated in our view to take the steps towards assimilation? Or is it the much more difficult to, of course, uh, put one's arm around it? the role of the assimilator or the acceptor to accept and the assimilation or the rather the integration. Thank you, Bjorn. I think that's those are excellent points. Um, I think the, the way you articulated the difference uh, between assimilation and integration was perfectly right as far as I understand it. Um, so then I'll just add two things. One is, um, Arendt would argue that what you called assimilation, right, is, requires a kind of, um, uh, uh, it imposes itself not only on, well, what you called integration focuses primarily on what she would call the political or legal world, the formal world. Um, and they can therefore live equally and yet be different, as, as I think you rightly put it. Whereas assimilation makes a stronger claim um, that you become uh, not different. Yes, uh, exactly. Uh, and which is why she said that anti-racism, not her word, but the modern word, the struggle against racism should not aim at assimilation, but should aim at integration in, 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 her, in her vocabulary or in political equality, not, not social and private equality. Um, uh, on the question of the enlightenment, um, you know, she, you, you presented the enlightenment as a, as a question of integration. I think she, in these texts, has a different reading of it, which she thinks the enlightenment is a, is a claim of assimilation. Um, she thinks that the enlightenment actually demands that we all, Christian and Jewish, black and white, um, uh, unburden ourselves of our history and our past. Now, I think clearly the way the Enlightenment plays out is that minority groups have a much 
uh, our, our demand, you know, our, our have a have a stronger demand on them to unburden of their past much more than the majority group, just because of the way um, the past of the majority group is seen as the general past that everyone has to assimilate to. Um, so I think you're right about that. Uh, on the last question about who should have the burden, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I need to think more about that because I, I I I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure one can say that one side should have more of the burden or not, but uh, it has to be reconciled or mutual. But maybe you're right, and maybe the majority does. I would want to. I'd want to talk to you more about that, I mean, and not in the of this sense. Yeah. From the sense simply that the one who holds the tools of power is the one who has the responsibility. Right. Yeah, I, I think right. that I think that's fair. Um, like I, I'd like to. I'd like to tease it out more, and but I don't have time right now. Um, but I think that's fair. Um, uh, Hannah, did you want to add something? Is your hand still well, up? Or well, he just mentioned the word that I think you know um, is critical, which is power relations, and also that I was trying to get in my bookshelf. Um, uh, some textbooks since I have billions of textbooks of sociology and they have you know if you want the definitions the different di differences between uh, prejudice and discrimination and integration and assimilation sociologists of race have done a very good job of that but I can't get them out of my bookcase because they're too tightly packed in but um, there, you know, to go to us to go to some sociological definitions are very helpful for everyone, in my opinion, because they've thought about it a great deal and do make very good distinctions. But I do feel that power relations, um, it really is a critical thing. And I have not read Hannah Arendt's political philosophy per se. I've just read her Jewish writings mainly, and Eichmann in Jerusalem, um, but maybe Hannah Arendt in The Human Condition or in what was the other famous uh, philosophy uh, that she the wrote? Bunch. On Revolution, there's, there's, there's a bunch between past and future. But I mean, you know, to see what she says on power relations. Um, on violence. Be, yeah. yeah, on yeah. violence, uh, because, you know, it does seem that the power obviously would be a huge issue. Right. Um, I get that. And I appreciate it. So look, um, we're at two thirty, and uh, I, I I have a feeling that we could go on for a long time. But the good news is this is a long book. <laughs> I hope that's good news. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity to to talk about the issues. Um, so why don't I say that we're going to end it here? And thank you guys for an incredibly hold on, hold on. Okay. provocative and thoughtful and respectful discussion. And um, we're going to return next week with the essay Anti-Semitism, uh, uh, starting on page 46, which is going to dig, 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 bring us deep into this. Um, so uh, I look forward to, to reading that with you next week. And um, thank you all. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and see you next week. <laughs>